It is such a privilege to be in church with you today or in your home if you're listening on stream. It's thank you for having me at your house. I could do with a cup of tea. What a great thing to be gathered. I love this church. I love this church because I've seen the fruit of it in so many ways. The great people like Ryan and Liza and Claude and Pastor John and Nick and so many people that are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might and are on mission, are on mission together. And so we just really thank you for sowing into Alpha and just sowing into evangelism in Australia. I was born in Brisbane. I don't know what it, I know, and now it's good to be back home. (laughs) I don't know what it was about me when I was a baby, but um, on my birth certificate, my father is unknown, and my mother um, handed me over for adoption. So it wasn't the best start in life. I don't know, was I crying? What does a child do? What does a baby do that's wrong? But there was a couple, Fred and Doris Busey, and they were pastoring a church here in Tagum Gardens. And they were Queenslanders, my dad had been a farmer, and you know, he, he then went and pastored a church. And they had been waiting a long, long time to adopt a child. And they felt God calling them to Adelaide, which if you're a Queenslander, you know that's God, right? Because there's no reason you would do it otherwise. And so they were planning to move to Adelaide and my mum rang up the adoption agency and said, we want to transfer the adoption from Queensland to South Australia. Now you would understand this, South Australia, we're Queenslanders. No, no, we don't deal with anybody else. You'll have to start all over again. And she must have been so disappointed on the phone that the person on the phone said, ah, let me think about it. She got a call an hour later. Hey, we have a baby girl here, would you like her? Now, I'm kind of wondering how that worked. Was I just kind of sitting around somewhere in a cot? They go, oh, oops, we didn't realize we had this one. I don't know what the circumstances was, but I know that God was in charge of them. And so they said, sure. So they were able to pick me up that afternoon. They they'd had nothing for babies. So they had to run out and get a few things. They picked me up. The next day, they went to their family farewell. All of the relatives were Queenslanders, so six kids on each side and multiple, multiple cousins. And, and they went to their farewell with the baby. And, and, and the parents are going, where's the baby come from? Whose is that? Is that yours? What's the whole thing was just a huge shock to everyone involved. And so they put me in a little bassinet. They had a Volkswagen. So they stuck me in the middle of the front seat, as you do, and we trekked off to Adelaide. You know, God says that before we're in our mother's womb, he knew us, that he planned our days, that he loves us, And so as I was adopted into this family and got to know my parents and the incredible love that they had for me, when I found out that God the Father was interested in adopting me into his family, I had a great picture of how that worked. When I knew that Jesus Christ loved me so much that he died for the forgiveness of my sins, that he rose again to show he had the power of life and death, and that he lived a life in the Gospels that showed me how to live, it's like, Wow, this is the greatest thing on the planet. And then he loved me so much that he sent the Holy Spirit to come and be my guide. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be adopted into God's family. That God loves us before he even knew it. My parents loved me before they ever knew me. They loved the idea of me. They loved the hope of me. They loved that one day they would have a child. And they were so grateful that she was born in Queensland. (laughs) A real child. You know, when I travel around, people say, I just want to get a word from God. I just want to know what God wants from me. Well, I have a 100% accurate prophetic word for you today. Are you ready? Do you want to write it down? Do you want to record it? Do you want to go, oh, this is, this is just too amazing? It goes like this. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Imagine if you and I took that as our mission. Imagine if the very last command of Jesus became our first priority. Imagine if what Jesus said was actually true. 
If he actually came and said, here's my mission for you. I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to help people know who Jesus is. I want you to help people know about the pathway of faith. Now, does that mean that we all quit our jobs and start going around street preaching? Well, that may be true for some, but it's not for all of us. You see, my husband works in business. He's got a real job, as opposed to me in the church, work Sundays. And (laughs) he is called to make disciples in his place of business. My daughter works for a marketing company, you know, doing food delivery, and she is called to make disciples. We are all called to make disciples. It's our mission, it's our priority, it's what we are called to do. The challenge is that along the way, many people have forgotten the imperative of evangelism. Now we can you know, look at America and learn from them because we're not as bad as them. But you know, young adults in America say that they shouldn't share their faith. You do you, I'll do me. We have to agree to disagree. Well, you have your faith and I have mine and mine is no religion. But Jesus didn't leave us with that option. He said, if you really love me, if you really love people, then you are called to the imperative of evangelism. The hard thing is that we think evangelism is really tough. What if someone asks me a question? I just wanna let you on a secret. I've been ordained minister for you know, 25, 30 years. Pastor of a church, done a whole lot of stuff, chair of Bible college, you know, yada, yada, long list of activity. But here's the thing that matters. I have unanswered questions. What about you? So if someone asks me a question, there are a lot of questions I don't know the answer to, which is why I got involved in Alpha, because you don't have to answer any question. (laughs) They just go, I think Jesus was an alien. And you go, oh, that's interesting. What does everybody else think? It's a mutual pooling of questions. There's a guy on a screen and there's a whole video series that we've produced, cost a couple of million pounds to give some information. But fundamentally, it's a safe place to explore the questions of life, to explore the things that are on our heart. So when we talk about the imperative of evangelism, it's not how can I answer every question. When we talk about the imperative of evangelism, it's kind of a bit more like Jesus, who over 70 times in the New Testament said, hey, come follow me. Let's hang out together. Let's discuss things. There's only one time when there's a hint in John 3 about being born again. Now, I'm not saying there's not a time when we, part, when we don't pass from death to life. There is a point of decision. But in the process of that, there's a journey of following. There's a journey of getting to know Jesus. And do you know how people in your world are getting to know Jesus? They know you. They see how you operate. They see how you handle the challenges of life. You know, in um, COVID, I was in Melbourne, they locked us in our houses for over 300 days, or 500 days, or 900 days, I forget. They just locked us in, they put a curfew on us. Queensland have done what we've wanted to do for years, put up a, you know, electricized fence. (laughs) And in that time, you know, we did all sorts of ways to reach out to people. And the interesting thing to me was I've met with this group of people that aren't Christians for 15 years, you know, been meeting with them. And during COVID, I texted them, hey, it's Easter time. If you wanna watch an Easter service, here's a few options. I have invited these people to church so many times, they've never come. But they all watched an Easter service. You see, what happens is we keep inviting, as we keep following, they start to join in on the following. We've got a WhatsApp group in our street. I don't know why, just to work out where to put the rubbish out, I guess. So we joined this WhatsApp group, and I just said, hey, I'm the chaplain to this area. If you've got any prayer requests, let me know. So then there's this whole thing. We have several judges and a few lawyers that live in our street. You know, it's just that kind of area. And they were trying to decide how I got appointed the chaplain. You know, who said? And I said, well, if you wanna have an election, I'm open. Like, any of you gonna be a better chaplain? So I've done this a couple of times, places where we've lived. And what's interesting is people would then direct message me, could you pray for this? Could you pray for this? Could you pray for this? Do you know that 70% of Australians, when privately surveyed, say they pray? Seven out of 10 people in your street pray. Most popular prayer is this, God help me often in crisis. 
So when we invite people into our life and start to tell them that we pray, that we'll pray for them, start to invite them to things, we start the process of them following Jesus. Remember Jesus told the story about a Pharisee that was in church, not this church because it wouldn't apply, but he was in a, in a church where this guy was praying and telling God how wonderful he was. And there was a sinner outside the church and Jesus said that one went away justified because in his heart he said, I'm not even worthy to come to church. Alpha's about people that are not even sure they're worthy to come to church. They're not even sure that, they don't even know how to access it. It's for people who know you and who recognize Jesus in you. You know, my husband had a, a business for a while and he sold it and he would get all the new staff together and he would say to them, hey, the owners of this business are Christian. And he said, that doesn't mean we're going to try and you know, force you to do anything, but it does mean we don't expect you to lie or to cheat or to tell falsehoods on our behalf. Now, the interesting thing is people check that out. Hey, look, we didn't pay sales tax on this. It got through. Well, we have to pay sales tax. Oh, look at this. They would check it out. They would test them. Do they live what they believe? Every day, someone is watching you, and you are making disciples without even realizing it. Your kids watch you, the people at work watch you. So we have to realize that imperative of evangelism. How can we share with people? We're looking at, well, we've actually bought a place up in the Sunshine Coast, and we've been looking at this for quite a long time. And um, there was a real estate agent that we found, and somehow we just kind of clicked with her. We'd seen quite a few, but this one. And you know, she went out of her way to knock on doors and to find a sale. And you know, I started talking about my life, what I did about Alpha. She said, I've heard of that. I said, oh, have you been along? No, I said, what you mean is not yet? Uh, probably. <laughs> so we had these conversations and went through that. Anyway, a, a little while in, she said, actually, you know, my parents were pastors. And she said, we used to go to church, but things happen and we no longer go to church. And we talked about it and then she, you know, we talked about, well, how are you bringing out your kids? And I said to her, can I pray with you? She said, sure. People think I'm gonna go away and pray. No, that's Claude. I pray there. Claude would pray there too. Hey, and just asking God's presence into her life. You know, whenever we pray with someone, the presence and power of God is manifest because we carry the presence of God and we get used to it. Remember the other day, I was, um, I was going through the supermarket checkout. I can't, that self things, they just, anyway, I like real people scanning my things. Um, and so I was going through the checkout and this, I said to the girl, how are you? You know, you look really busy. Oh yeah, I'm really busy and I'm feeling sick. She like said three things. She was feeling sick, she was overwhelmed and she was busy. And you know, I was sort of scanning my items and then I said, would you like me to pray for you? Now that doesn't happen often at the checkout. It never happens at the self-serve. So she went, oh yeah, 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 sure. So I just leant over, because I'm not gonna go out and pray. Leant over, put my hand on her arm, and just prayed for it. Now here's the thing, keep your eyes open, in case security comes. Keep it short, right? Because you're in a supermarket checkout, and there's people behind you. And I just say, God, I just pray for her, and she's got her name on her, which is really handy. Just pray for that, you will just show her your peace, and your love, and your grace. Pray it in Jesus' name, amen. It probably went about that long. I always use Jesus' name because that's who our hope is in. And she goes, oh, 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 and kept checking out the items. Now you probably say, why didn't you stop, invite her to church and baptize her? <laughs> I've got to leave something for you guys to do. <laughs> I'm a link in that chain of 12 people that are bringing people to faith. We are links in the chain that are helping people on the journey of faith. The intentionality of invitation, of inviting people to follow Jesus. Now. I work for Alpha, so obviously I'm an expert on invitation. I'm gonna teach you how to invite someone to Alpha or church or whatever. You ready? Would you like to come to Alpha? <laughs> Step one. Step two is the hard one. Are you up for it? Step one. Would you like to come to Alpha? Step two. Be quiet. Now you can appreciate why for me that's hard, right? Because what happens is I get so excited and say, would you like to come to Alpha? Would you like to come to church? Would you like to come to Easter production, Christmas production? 
And then I go, you know, Alpha is just a series of interactive activities. We just come one week at a time. We have some food, we chat, we talk to each other. We explore the questions of life. Every question is valid. Every question, there's such respect and tolerance. We love having people of diversity there. And we just come along, I'll come with you. If you don't come, if you don't wanna come, it's okay. We can still be friends, but I love you enough to invite you along. And it'd be great if you came. <laughs> Generally, by the end of my explanation, we've both forgotten why we're there. Would you like to come to Alpha and then be quiet? You know why? This is a shock to many of you. God is already at work in people before they connect with you. If you wanna read about Philip and the Ethiopian, Philip is walking down a lonely road and there's an Ethiopian and he just kind of walks alongside and the Ethiopian just happens to be reading the Bible and just happens to have questions. You know when we be quiet, when we shut up, do you know what happens? We see where that person is. We see what God's been doing in their lives. We see what the perspective is, but we have to be intentional about invitation. Luke tells us the sower went out to sow. It's something we do daily. John says, Andrew brought his brother to Jesus. The intentionality of invitation. Uh, many years ago, my husband and I were, he's involved in business, and we were invited to join a Christian business group. And we were also invited to join a secular. He'd done a course at Harvard Business School, and there was a, a group of people that we could invite. And we looked at it and we thought, we really like Christians. Look around, nice people, really nice people. Probably gonna see you in heaven, we hope. But let's not get into that. So we thought, we're gonna see those, but why don't we meet with a group of people that don't yet know Jesus? And it was a tough gig, you know? The first time we introduced, they told, um, you know, John introduced that he had a business and they're happy with that, and she's a minister, not happy with that. So half the people probably didn't speak to me for the first couple of years. Because as the woman who owned the house was introduced said, I don't think I've ever met a minister before. We don't all look like me. And she said, I don't think I've ever met a person of faith before. I said, you have now. So we go on a journey. Anyway, I've been meeting with this group of people monthly for a long time. And I, maybe a year and a half ago, I thought, I'm, I'm sick of this. I've been meeting with these people, the only, and they've all been through crisis, and the only thing that they ever say about me is, hey, I'm getting divorced, I want a new life, but I don't want to find Jesus. Like, that's how much they know Jesus is what they need. Um, and so it's like, I'm gonna give up on these. Within a minute, maybe less, I felt the Holy Spirit say, you can't stop. You are the only person in the world praying for them. Do you know that our intentionality of invitation begins with prayer. How can we pray for people? How do we pray for the people in our street? How do we pray for the people in our work? How do we pray for the, for the um, parents of, of our kids' friends? You know, every class that my daughter was in, all of them got invited every year to Easter, Christmas, and something else. Why not? They invite me to their fundraising things. I invite them to come to church and they don't have to pay. You see, the intentionality of invitation, it's allowing invitation and discipleship to be a part of how we live. But how do we do that? We do that by the indwelling and infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, can you imagine this guy, Peter and John, you know, the disciples, they had lived and walked with Jesus for three years. They'd been able to ask any question. And yet at the end of the three years, Jesus looks around and goes, hmm, you guys need to wait here. There is something else you need. You need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You see, they had seen the evidence of the Holy Spirit at work through Jesus. And Jesus was able to do the things he was able to do because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved him with compassion. The Holy Spirit helped him to work out what the Father's business was. The Holy Spirit helped him to pick the guy who was the best cook and say, come down from there, I'm coming to your place for dinner. The Holy Spirit was with him. And so he said, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. So they just prayed, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, over and over and over again. And the work of the Holy Spirit began to give them power. You know, as we are going about our business, we need to pray, come Holy Spirit. Every morning I try and get my diary out and pray, hey Holy Spirit, come. What question do you want me to ask? What do you want me to do? Mainly because I'm not very smart. 
So I would often have counselling appointments and people would come to see me and, you know, we'd be having cups of tea and we'd pray and they'd be walking out the door and they'd say, oh, and by the way, I'm getting divorced. It's like, we just spent an hour talking about... So now, I just ask the Holy Spirit, what question should I ask? How's your marriage? You see, the Holy Spirit is able to give us wisdom. We need his power. We need his infilling. You know, Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. I'm not a brave person. I'm just a person who tries to listen to the Holy Spirit. I don't go on those scary rides. I never jumped out of a plane. But I have been shot at. I have had someone come out with a knife. I have talked to kings. I have been in prisons. I have done a whole lot of stuff I never expected to do because the Holy Spirit just says, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you walk on this road? Why don't you come alongside this person? But as we're going around making disciples, we're generally out there in the marketplace. As I said to Pastor John, the Google search words are all asking about God. The challenge is they don't always know someone of faith. So the reason we do things like Alpha and Christmas and Easter and special events is so that we can give people a reason, an excuse, or we can give ourselves an excuse to invite them to church. You see, making disciples is not just making a decision, it's a lifestyle of following Jesus. And as people are following Jesus, they will be added to the church. We, we are in a situation where those that believe the message, about 3,000, were added to the church. So the concepts behind Alpha are this, you belong before you believe, before you behave. So we meet in homes, we meet in cafes, and you are welcome, you are accepted, you are respected, your points of view are valid, you belong, you're invited into community. And there might come a point at which you believe. And then as you start to believe, perhaps your behavior will change. Your behavior will always change as you believe. Because we're new creations. You know what happens often in a, in a sporting club or a church is that if you behave and you believe, then we'll let you belong. We're turning it around. We're saying, we want to welcome you into community. We want to welcome you. We want to accept you. We want you to know that you are loved and that you are able to be in a community of faith. Ephesians 1 puts it this way. I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. He has called you to this hope. To make disciples. To make Jesus' last command our first priority wherever we are. He, God, placed all things under the feet of Jesus and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. Jesus Christ has all authority in heaven on earth. He is seated at the right hand of God, interceding for you. He has the Holy Spirit walking with us, whispering, prompting us, guiding us, ordering our steps. The mission is possible but it's also critical. How do you and I make disciples? I want to tell you one last story as we close. I, um, when I was 13, I saw a picture of myself preaching in Africa. You know, God can give us visions and pictures, and I was really excited and ready to go. But like what happens when God speaks to you, often people try and get in the way. My parents were very, very negative. They said, you have to finish school before you go to Africa. And so I started finishing school and realized I wanted to make money and, you know, just forgot about the Africa thing. Ended up, you know, felt God's calling to be in ministry, you know, working for nothing, as you do, and then ended up pastoring a church. And I was pastoring a church and involved in all sorts of things, and I felt the Holy Spirit, pretty sure it was the Holy Spirit, because I would never have thought about this myself. See, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the Word of God, through other people, through this prompting. I've never heard the audible voice of God, but I'm starting to recognize the promptings. And so the prompting was this, you need to help prisoners in Nigeria. Does that seem weird to you? Seem weird to me. Anyway, cut a long story, because that's not the main event. I, um, I, I ended up in Nigeria. The Muslim guy who was in charge of prisons decided I was sent from God and I could go into any prison I wanted. I didn't want to go into any prison. Are you kidding me? I'm there to give some money and run. <laughs> anyway, ended up going to prisons. You know, we 
you know, we've discipled hundreds of pastors now in that. In Nigeria, we got a guy in Australia who's not a Christian to donate a printing press, so we, we print Bible correspondent studies in a shed in Nigeria for prisoners. So started getting involved in Nigeria, been there 17 times, and really got a heart for that nation. I was at a, a gathering, a dinner, and this guy came up to me, he was all crumpled, and he kind of, you know, had been traveling a lot, and he said, I am a pastor from the Congo. And he said, I want to come and invite, you know, Pastor Brian Houston, who was, um, you know, my boss at the time. He said, um, to, I'd like to invite Pastor Brian to the Congo. I thought to myself, good luck with that. So I introduced him to Pastor Brian, and, you know, I said, you know, about the, you know, this is from the Congo. And he said, Pastor Brian, would you come to the Congo? At which point, Pastor Brian looked at me with not a godly look. Um, you know, basically, I'm going to kill you. Um, and then he goes, actually, I'm busy, but I'm going to send my representative, Melinda, at which point I had the ungodly look. So we had this conversation. A couple of weeks later, this guy turns up at my office at the church, and he says, you know, I really want to invite you to come to the Congo. And I thought, there's no way. And as he was talking to me, I just said, God, you don't want me to do this, right? And I felt the Holy Spirit say, you should go. So I said to him, Maybe. You, know, you, you don't want to get too carried away. So he gave me an invitation to come in October, and I said, look, I'm a, I'm, I've got a wonderful husband. He loves me. I have to ask him and submit this to him. And he really loves me. So let's see what he says. <laughs> so I go home, and I talk to my husband. You can, I talk to my husband. I said, look, I had this guy come and see me from the Congo. I don't know much about the Congo, but it doesn't sound pleasant. Um, and, you know, he wants me to go there, and you're the head of our home, which both of us kind of went, oh. Um, <laughs> and because it's the casting vote thing. And so you're the head of our So if you don't want me to go, I won't go. Right? Beautiful, I'm off the hook. And he said to me, where's that painting that I bought to our house when we got married? What painting? So I went to the cupboard where the things that John had brought to our home were stored in a special place, <laughs> a safe place, in the dark. So we bought out this painting that's up here, and I said to him, what, what the heck is this? He said, you know, Sarah, when I was 13, so he's now in his 60s, he said, when I was 13, a gentleman called Willie Burton came from the Congo to Australia. He was a missionary from England to the Congo. He came to Australia and said, can you send missionaries to the Congo? And he stayed next door to my grandfather, who was the head of a church. We can have the band come up. And it, who was the head of a church. Will you send missionaries? So this group of people, pastors, got together and prayed and said, no. Our mission field is Papua New Guinea. So they said, will you actually go to Papua New Guinea and will you train missionaries? So this poor guy not only isn't getting anyone to help him, now he's got to go and do some work. So while he was there, he painted a picture of the Congo. And my husband lived next door and he saw this picture. And as he presented this picture to my husband's grandfather, he said, maybe one day you or your descendants will come to the Congo. He said, I'm going to pray that will happen. And my husband, who, you know, isn't really an art critic, there was something about this picture that captured his attention. It didn't capture mine um, at the time. And he pulled it out and he said, I think that maybe you're the answer to this prayer. And I said, surely you are. <laughs> I'm not of the bloodline. I'm grafted into the family. And he said, no, he prayed. And God heard the prayer. So we got this picture, which is now in my office. And I went to the Congo. It's kind of a long story, but... I ended up being there one day. They wanted people to do missionary training. I was there with a gentleman who was a mission trainer, had seen 2,000 churches planted in Papua New Guinea. And I was telling the story about how I got there. And he said, Willie Burton came to New Guinea, taught us about missions. We then planted 2,000 churches. He said, now to come back to the Congo and to be doing missionary training is an amazing privilege. We knelt there in that little place. We're working with thousands of churches in the Congo. Won't even explain what God has opened up doing French and Lingali training and, you know, just kind of doing what we could to influence. We knelt there and realised 
that we were a part of prayers that had been spoken three generations ago. That we were there because God hears the prayers of his people and he takes us on a journey of following him. I wonder if you've got your phones with you today. If you haven't, can you come and see me? Because I want to know how to do that. (laughs) Take your phone out. This is probably the only time. Well, I'm giving you permission in church to get your phone out, whatever else normally happens. Do you know in my phone is my diary? In my phone is my contacts. In my phone is my social media. In my phone is my WhatsApp group. In my phone are the people that I connect with. Imagine if I started praying for them. Imagine if I started realising that Jesus died for each one of them. Imagine if I started realising that evangelism was an imperative. Imagine if I started realising I need to be intentional about my conversation, about the books that I give, about the invites that I give. Imagine if I needed to believe that God was able to work. Would you stand with me today? With your phone in your hand, I know it's doing two things at once. Pretend you're female. (laughs) We are going to bring our phones before the Lord. We are going to ask for the people in this phone to have an opportunity to come to know Jesus. It might be through us. It might be through three generations ahead. But as we pray, the Holy Spirit works. As we pray, He prompts us to speak and invite. Would you just take, and this is kind of a bit weird, but I'm only here today. We're going to take our phones and we're going to do a bit of a wave offering before the Lord. God, we present our communities before you. We present our friends. We present our social media. We present our diaries. We gather here for refreshing, but tomorrow we're on the field. Tomorrow we're in the game. Tomorrow we're on mission, influencing people. Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for every name represented in my phone. Father God, thank you that you aren't, you have, you don't just have love, you are love to every one of them, that you want to adopt them into your family. Lord Jesus, that your grace has been shed abroad for them. Holy Spirit, would you come and be the comforter and counsellor and guide for them? And would you be the guide for us in how we can influence them, how we can pray for them more, how we can invite them more? How can we help them to follow Jesus through the lives that we live? Would you put your hand on your heart? Lord, would you move my heart for what moves yours? Would you shed abroad in my heart your compassion, your grace, your love for the people in my street, people in my WhatsApp group, people I connect with at school, people I connect with at work, people that I randomly come in contact with at supermarkets and at Ubers. Would you move my heart with compassion and would you give me an opportunity to influence someone to follow you? I pray it in Jesus' name. Just close your eyes for one more and I want to do the thing that this church exists for. You know, I was adopted into God's family because I'd seen the evidence of love in other families. And you've probably seen the evidence of love in the people around you. I know that you've heard the Holy Spirit because you're here. And it's the Holy Spirit who whispers to us, you need Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus is knocking at the door of our heart. And if you want to see the picture, there's a handle and it's only on the inside. Only you can invite Jesus into your life. The work of being adopted into God's family, his death, his resurrection has already happened. But you need to apply it to your life. I want to ask you today, where is Jesus? Is he outside the door of your heart knocking or is he living with you? If he's outside the door of your heart knocking, I want to ask, what do you want to do about that? Is it your time to open that door and invite Jesus in? I'm going to pray a prayer in a moment and I'm going to invite all of us here to pray it after me but I want to especially invite you to pray it after me as you open that door of your heart to Jesus you're inviting him in let's pray shall we dear God thank you for loving me Jesus thank you 
for dying for me, for showing me how to live, and for showing your power over death. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to forgive my sins, to make me a brand new person, and to help me follow you. Holy Spirit, would you be my friend? Would you help me follow Jesus? I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.